Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, I will. Uh, so th this this talk uh, has basically two parts. The first part is going to be a bit more, uh, in a sense, historical. Uh, I will spend actually a lot of time talking about the control in general, just as like concept, because I think it's really it's really good to understand uh, the the way of thinking in, in in control, and it's it's ultimately it's not a very complicated thing, but uh, it does. It does help quite a bit to have this kind of a, a way of thinking in mind. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, some more classical uh, intelligent transportation system and traffic control. And then in the second part, I'll go uh, into the deep end and uh, basically talk about my research, at least on this side, and talk about the Lagrangian traffic control and how connected autonomous vehicles can help the, the grid. So uh, to expand a bit, uh, I come from a uh, control background, so that's why I will spend a lot of time talking about control, because I really like control. <laughs> and uh, so I did my bachelor's in, and uh, master's in Belgrade on automatic control. Then I did my PhD at KTH in Stockholm, and there I kind of sh shifted into traffic, and I was working on exactly this kind of thing, the modeling and control of uh, modeling and Lagrangian control of mixed traffic, and that's mixed between uh, connected and autonomous vehicles and uh, uh, and human-driven vehicles. And then, uh, uh, yeah, so right now, for the time being, for the next four weeks, I'll be still in Grenoble, uh, working on uh, uh, with uh, Professor Carlos Gonzalez de Vito on uh, modeling and control of electromobility, so electric vehicles. It's still kind of a mixed uh, traffic type thing but uh, a bit of a different uh, type of mixing. Uh, and then uh, after that, I'll shift to uh, Berkeley, working more or less on the continuation on, on uh, what I've been working on during my PhD and uh, this postdoc. Uh, yeah, so the lab that I come from has a, a bunch of work with, uh, has done a bunch of work with uh, traffic simulation and traffic modeling, and uh, mostly focusing on the Grenoble area. So starting first from uh, modeling a, a road in the south of uh, Grenoble, a highway, uh, a stretch of highway. That was the GTL Rocad. Then uh, focusing, uh, shifting focus towards urban traffic. So that's GTL Bill, which you can, by the way, play with if you scan that thing here. Uh, and then came COVID. So everyone started working on COVID related issues. And uh, the group also shifted a bit towards the mo mobility uh, in the context of uh, epidemic spread. And that's the health mob. Uh, more recently, the focus has shifted towards electric vehicles. Uh, and uh, right now what's ongoing is that there's this push to develop a, sort of a digital twin. So now, uh, right now what the lab is working on is uh, electric mobility. So electric vehicles, how they kind of interact with the power grid and with the traffic overall. The idea is to adapt the, the modeling framework from normal kind of traffic to electric vehicles and then see how we can optimize uh, optimize all of the things and control it, control it with, uh, with a mind towards the, the grid. Right, so one good thing about uh, traffic and working about traffic is it's, it's usually really easy to motivate why we want to uh, control it because uh, you have, uh, uh, I believe you all have a kind of personal experience with traffic. So it's not something, uh, it's not, we're not talking nuclear reactors that you've heard about or maybe, yeah, you know about but not worked with and not experienced with, uh, experienced directly. Uh, and uh, the thing that we're mostly talking about when it comes to traffic is the congestion and how can we reduce it and uh, make it go away. And there are many reasons why we are focusing on that. Uh, safety is uh, well, safety is an issue if, if you have a lot of congestion. Uh, the emissions are are going to be increased if you have a very this very uh, inefficient uh, regime of traffic, and so on and so forth. And because since the transportation uh, consists uh, or contributes a large portion of uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions, it's, it makes sense to try to reduce some emissions from that by reducing congestion. But that's all fine because in five years we'll have uh, self-driving cars, right? The problem is uh, we have been having self, we will have self-driving cars in five years for the last 15 years. So that's uh, a bit of a, a tricky thing there. And um, while I was making the slides for the last year's uh, talk, I was thinking kind of when did I get interested in, in self-driving cars? When, when was the last uh, first time I've heard about self-driving cars? And for me, that was uh, around 2005 when there was this uh, DARPA uh, grand challenge where in the US in some desert in Nevada, I think, they had the uh, cars out and they were supposed to be uh, driving some sort of a track. Uh, it's just like uh, given by some waypoints 
uh, fully autonomously. First year, they ran it in 2004, failed miserably. 2005, there were a bunch of cars that actually made it and uh, completed the track. And we have come a long way since then. Uh, I think the next kind of, by the way, what I'm showing up here is the Gartner hype cycle. So that kind of uh, shows the interest uh, for a technology and the hype around a technology. So that was the very beginning of the hype cycle. Then I would say the next part, right? So you were here, then there was a lot of the development and around 2014, uh, we get the first, uh, I, I would say that probably around the first, that's probably around the, the time we have the first commercially available uh, self-driving cars to a degree. So that's when Tesla's autopilot, around the time when Tesla's autopilot uh, was released. And there was a lot of hype. Uh, so I started my PhD in 2016. So believe me, there was a lot of hype and a lot of people working on uh, autonomous vehicles back then. Uh, and then 2018, uh, we had the first uh, fatal crash uh, involving a pedestrian outside of the vehicle and an autonomous car. So I, I would say that kind of uh, burst the bubble a bit. There's still a lot of interest in autonomous vehicles, but we are a bit more realistic and uh, a bit more disappointed in, in what the technology can do. And uh, if you think about the far, far future where all vehicles are autonomous, you can uh, have uh, an insanely uh, efficient type of traffic such as you see here. Well, not quite, but you get the point. And there are some, indeed, some works on uh, uh, controlling intersections. By the way, this is obviously uh, edited. It's not real. Uh, there's a lot of work, uh, for example, the, um, controlling the intersection. And if you assume that all vehicles are co connected and communicating, then you can really get impressive results. But uh, throw in uh, a human driver in, in this uh, chaos and yeah, things fall apart uh, quite soon. So what do we do for the time being? Well, I mean, we've been dealing with the problem of traffic for a very long time and uh, we do know brutally what uh, we can do. Uh, there are a lot of uh, classical approaches to traffic control. And uh, I would say one thing that is kind of a common thing for them uh, is that they tend to rely on uh, stationary sensors. So we have things like inductive loops, uh, gantries with micro uh, microwave sensors and so on. And you also have uh, stationary actuators like uh, traffic lights, like variable uh, variable speed limit signs and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and I mean, that is great. The problem is uh, you kind of have to put all of these things everywhere if you want to be able to do control everywhere. And uh, that is not necessarily a, a very economic thing to do. Uh, you do know where you should have control. It's around bottlenecks and so on, but uh, still, it's, it, it is uh, an investment that you need to do. On the other side, uh, even though we don't have, uh, and we don't, and we probably never will have a, a situation where we have all autonomous vehicles, there's still something that uh, they can contribute. And there, there's quite a lot, actually, I would, I would say. So there are a lot of these emerging traffic control methods that uh, a lot of them involve uh, co control, uh, connected autonomous vehicles uh, at some point in the grid. Uh, and on the side of the sensors, so you can think of these vehicles either communicating their uh, trajectory, how they're moving along the road, uh, and then use, we, we can use those trajectories to learn something about the traffic state. And by the way, this is a very, very old idea with floating cars. You uh, probably heard about that. Uh, but right now, I mean, now we can get much more, um, now we can get the, the update much faster and uh, we can really do it real time. And also, interestingly, on the side of actuation, sure, you have autonomous vehicles that might be able to drive in a certain autonomous way, but there is also an option, since they're connected, to actually communicate some sort of control inputs to them and then they can do something for you, uh, not only locally, but you can also affect the traffic overall. Uh, so with that in mind, the question, the main question of the, the well, these two, three hours, however many, is how can we reduce traffic congestion using uh, both classical and emerging uh, traffic control? Right, so how can actually traffic control help? Well, if you think about the whole transportation system on a very, very reductive level, uh, this is more or less as simple as you can get. So you have some demands for trips. Uh, then those demands or well, vehicles and people inside of these vehicles. By the way, here I am focusing on road traffic, so I will mostly be talking about vehicles, but it's really about people, of course. These vehicles enter the road network. Uh, they spend some time in the road network, and then uh, they arrive at their destination. 
and uh, they have completed their trip, and that's great. So if you think about how do we improve the operation of this system and how do we evaluate how well the system is operating, uh, then one kind of logical uh, option is, of course, the total time span. Because assuming all trips complete, or assuming everyone gets to where they want to, uh, the less time they, they spend in the network, the better. First, because they're at their destination faster. But second, because while they're inside of the road network, they're, of course, creating some uh, crowd uh, crowding and congestion for the other vehicles, which will slow them down. So not only are they being slower, the other vehicles are being slower, and uh, and that is one. So this is so. I mean, if you think about a bucket with a hole, and you're pouring water into that bucket, sure, after some time, the, it will start filling up because the inflow is higher than the outflow. But as this water level in the bucket increases, the outflow will also increase. So you will you might be uh, stabilized at some point. The traffic, unfortunately, is the other way around because uh, once you get congestion, then once you get congestion because the demands exceed the capacity, then not only do you have uh, uh, people waiting and queuing, but you also have a capacity drop, which reduces the capacity further and exacerbates uh, congestion uh, in turn. So this is really something that we, we should deal with uh, by control. Uh, now, you might ask, why focus on travel time? And this is, uh, I would say this is a question, uh, especially in relation to this first uh, uh, sub-question, that I think it is becoming a bit more uh, important and people are asking it more and more. So why do we focus on travel time? Why not focus on the emissions? Because emissions are kind of important, right? Well, the problem is um, they are not that easy to, to model. When it comes to the travel time, we pretty much know what we're doing. We just have the state of the traffic and that translates nicely into the travel time. When it comes to emissions, it not only depends on the traffic state, it also depends on the accelerations, a lot of details. And in the end, if we reduce congestion, we hope that we're also reducing emissions. Uh, why not focus on safety? Uh, well, I mean, there the situation is even worse. It's uh, how, I mean, how do you quantify the probability of a crash based on traffic conditions? Sure, you can do it to a degree, but again, the modeling part is, is much, much harder. So from the mathematical side, so much easier to focus on travel time. And then finally, what about induced demand? If we increase capacity, will that not just cause demand to go up? Yes, but then we're also dealing with economic models and uh, other things that are, are quite uh, complicated. So for the time being, let's, fo let's focus on what we have and optimize the, the infrastructure that is, is there. So what we can do, is uh, mostly uh, mostly comes down to dealing with bottlenecks because uh, once a bottleneck gets congested, there is a capacity, there is a traffic breakdown and a capacity drop, so we lose efficiency there. Uh, and uh, another uh, interest, another problem that is not so commonly talked about are the phantom jams. And uh, I can tell you what phantom jams are, or I can let Tom Cruise do that for me. Department of Transportation. I've been there over ten years now. What do you do with the DOT? I study traffic patterns. You hit the brakes for a second, just tap them on the freeway. You can literally track the ripple effect of that action across a 200-mile stretch of road because traffic has a memory. It's amazing. It's like a living organism. I'm really annoyed that I did not know of that clip before I was like before. So now, now I'm now it's too late to include it in all my uh, in all my uh, slides. But yeah, anyway. So what what am I talking about? Well, we have a phantom traffic jam occurring on this road. There it is. You can see the vehicles kind of stopping and then accelerating, and it does proper yeah, There we go, and the, it does kind of travel up the road. It's not that easy to see, maybe, but uh, anyways, th these kind of uh, phenomena they can also uh, exhibit some sort of a, ca a capacity drop. So we definitely don't want to have them if we can help it. <laughs> right. So. Intelligent transportation system is an extremely broad topic. Uh, there's a, a lot of parts and it's impossible to talk about all of them. So I'll just, uh, I mean, what, what even are they? So they're advanced applications, blah, blah, blah. Basically everything about, about the asphalt, the cars themselves and the signs. But signs can be a part of intelligent transportation system if they're variable message signs and cars also can be if they're connected and autonomous. And even asphalt might become a part of the intelligent transportation system once we have uh, electric highways, if we have electric highways, and so on. So it basically encompasses uh, essentially well, most of the transportation system. 
Uh, but still, some points, uh, some points worth talking about. Of course, traffic sensors, uh, not necessarily a part of the intelligent transportation systems, but uh, as we uh, as we have mentioned, they are a very important part of that. And sure, you start with very kind of low low tech sensors like inductive loops, but then and then get all the way towards cameras, uh, mobile phones, and so on. Plenty of interesting things to talk about there. Uh, then probably the part of ITS that you've uh, had most experience with, the route guidance or navigation apps. Well, now it's navigation apps. Back then it used to be variable message signs and things like that. So uh, if you're controlling what recommendation Google uh, tells you, then you can uh, affect the traffic patterns quite a bit. Because if you transfer, if you direct everyone to go towards one, one path, then that path might get congested, even though it didn't, it wasn't congested to begin with. So there's something to think about there for sure. Uh, then there's of course the probably the oldest traffic control, uh, at least uh, equipment, the traffic lights. And there's a lot to do there. Uh, there's um, you can optimize the the timing. You can uh, create these kind of green waves. You can uh, control the cycle of traffic lights dynamically by uh, taking uh, account of the traffic state. Uh, you can even do some sort of things like perimeter control, where if there's congestion in a part of the city, you kind of restrict the inflow to this part until we have a, until the situation gets better. Then you have congestion prices uh, pricing, which is also a, a quite efficient uh, methodology and uh, applied in some cities uh, with uh, a lot of success. Stockholm being one, for example, this is from Stockholm. Uh, where you can basically either schedule the pricing, so in the rush hour it's expensive to go into the uh, the city and so on, or you do it uh, dynamically, so that based on the actual traffic situation in the city, you increase the price to to reduce the inflow, hopefully, and many many others. So you have uh, ride hailing, multimodal transport, fleet management, electric vehicle charging, parking lights, a lot of things. So there's a lot of things that uh, I could be talking about. What I will be talking about is first I'll give a, a hopefully brief introduction to some basics of control, uh, a bit more than just the, the control loop. Uh, then I'll talk about platooning first because uh, I think it is uh, an interesting um, an interesting example of control and an interesting example of what is going on. Uh, then I'll talk uh, next I'll talk about some briefly about um, classical traffic control and there I'll start with uh, traffic modeling, recount that a bit. Uh, go into ramp metering and variable speed limits, which are probably the two most common uh, methods of traffic con control these days. Uh, and then finally, the, the second part uh, considers Lagrangian traffic control, and I'll talk a bit more about that when I get to, to that point. Right, so first, uh, I don't believe you have much experience with control systems. Otherwise, it would, this would be a bit, this would sound a bit patronizing, but uh, humor me because I hope I have interesting uh, uh, examples, at least funny examples. All right. So, what is control? What is what does control theory do? Well, the the idea is to make the system or the plant something that we are trying to control uh, do something, right? And uh, in in the most reductive way, if you think of this plant as just a glass of water, then what you might want to do with it is fill it, and you can apply some control to the uh, uh, handle of the faucet. Uh, open the open the tap, and then you get some water flow out of this actuator or something that they, they use to affect the plant. Then you get the water uh, flow entering the plant, and the water level will increase. Extremely simple, but uh, this will make the glass of water fill. But we are not really encoding what we want it to do exactly. So important part is. Uh, Again, as the parent mentioned, the reference. So usually what we're doing is we want to make this plant do something that we uh, set as a reference for it. And uh, now we're shifting the, the example towards setting a water temperature uh, for a shower. So you want to enter the shower, uh, you set some, uh, you have experience with showers, obviously, uh, you set some uh, kind of a level or some angle to the, the shower uh, handle, the handle of the, the shower faucet. Uh, and uh, that should, in theory, uh, give you the temperature of water that you want. So if you have mixing of cold and hot water, there's the, the temperature that you get. Uh, and that's great. Is this how we all enter the, the shower? We just select the, the position of the handle and the jump in? Well, 
it would be great if we did not have the disturbances. And these disturbances can be external, or something like, uh, well, maybe the hot water has a lower temperature than expected, or it could be, it could just represent our lack of knowledge of the model. So maybe we don't exactly know where we need to put the handle in order to get just the, the right temperature. Now, one thing that you could do is you could measure this disturbance. So you could have uh, temperature sensors on the hot water and cold water uh, uh, pipes, and then feed that into your experience, into your feed forward control, and then refine what you're setting the controller to do. Of course, this is uh, ridiculous. No one, other than, I, I don't believe we have uh, that many uh, temperature sensors in, in the plumbing. So instead, obviously, what you do is touch the water. So you close the loop, you use some sort of a sensor, in this case, your hand, you take a measurement of the output, so touch the water, uh, and then using this information, then you create some sort of an error signal, which tells you, okay, how far are we from what the desired temperature of water is, and then feed that to, again, some experience-based controller, adjust the control input, and then hopefully the, the water is just right. So not, next time you're stepping into a shower, you'll be thinking of uh, control theory. You can tag me later. Uh, of course, uh, thinking about a bit more realistic, kind of a, a bit less ridiculous example, you could think of also of, um, for example, controlling the speed of a car a bit closer to what we're working with. And in that case, the, the plant uh, is your car. The actuator would be the throttle valve. Uh, the feedback controller is the cruise control uh, the cruise control uh, logic, and the sensor is the speedometer. So basically, uh, and notice that here, we don't really have the feed forward component because we can actually uh, achieve uh, most, if not almost everything, uh, um, everything that we want by just using feedback control. Usually that is, uh, is enough. So we have a, some sort of a reference speed, and then hopefully the, the uh, the actual speed of the car will go towards that reference speed. And the disturbance in this case would be the slope, the wind, these kind of things. Okay, pretty simple. Now, one thing, uh, I, I am spending a bit more time here because I really want to drill the, these kind of basic like uh, control uh, concepts because I think it's important. The one thing that you might ask is why really feedback control? If you, maybe you're not convinced by the the stupid shower examples or something. Uh, and there are really three big reasons. One is, uh, as we had in the shower example, it is resistant uh, to both external disturbances and maybe more important um, to variations in what we think the model is doing. So we don't really need to get the model uh, exactly right. And we can also deal with the disturbances that we might not have predicted and that we definitely don't uh, measure. Uh, for example, I mean, if you're pouring a glass of water, you know everything about the volume of the water, everything about the flow, the flow of water, you might be able to pour it nicely, but it's gonna be tough. Uh, other thing is that often it can be very simple and very cheap to apply control in a, um, in a feed for, feedback way. So think of a water heater, a simple thermostat is, is controlling it and it, it does its job relatively well. You can model all of the dynamics of the temperatures inside of a water boiler, but uh, yeah, it's very hard. Uh, and thirdly, and uh, very importantly for at least for the control theorist, uh, we can stabilize an otherwise unstable plant using feedback control. And we can only stabilize an unstable plant using feedback control. So if you think about riding a bicycle with your eyes closed, good luck. You might have a great sense of balance, odds are you are going to fall. You really need to measure the, the current state in order to uh, be able to stabilize something that is unstable. But on the other hand, uh, it's not all good. Uh, one bad thing about feedback control is if you're thinking about disturbances that are entering the system, you don't really react to them until you see them at the output. So in some sometimes when you can measure or predict these disturbances, it is obviously uh, best to combine this with some feed forward control. and. Uh, in, in the case of riding a bicycle, you see a curve coming. So you do a bit of a lean in instead of just driving and then waiting for it to get you off balance. And then you, uh, then you uh, try to correct or, or pull. Uh, also, in some cases, it's just too complex. Uh, 
let's say you have street lights, you could measure the luminosity outside or you could just schedule them. It's much simpler and it does the job. And also, if you're not careful, you can destabilize an otherwise stable plant. And the famous example, Tacoma Narrows Bridge, uh, they were supposed to um, cancel out the oscillations due to wind. They ended up amplifying it, the bridge collapsed. So you don't do that. So what do we do? Well, I mean, of course, it's best to do both, right? So if you have some measurements of disturbances, and especially if you know the, what the disturbance will be in the future, or if you know what the reference, how the reference will change in the future, definitely add the feed forward part. For the rest, uh, feedback works really well. All right, so I would be, uh, the, the the part until now, uh, the, this talk about control, uh, I could have given the exact same talk uh, 30 years ago. Okay, not me, I was not very eloquent 30 years ago, but um, there are of course many new things uh, happening in control and uh, I would be, it would not be good to not mention them, at least mention them. Uh, first, there is a, there has been a lot of interest about on uh, optimization-based control. And there we split the story a bit. So we're not necessarily tracking some sort of a reference. We could be tracking a reference, but we instead want to optimize some sort of an index of the system. This kind of a control is really good because it can incorporate a lot of uh, different uh, constraints. It uh, does it in a very, uh, very kind of natural way. And you also have a, a, a lot more freedom in how you design the, the uh, the cost function that you want to optimize. And then also, of course, uh, uh, mach machine learning based control and uh, uh, incorporating learning in any part of this control loop. Now you can have uh, the learning part just uh, when it comes to learning the model and then uh, classical control on the model that you've learned, or you can just basically close the, the loop completely over learning. Uh, well, okay, learning plus the measurements. And in that case, you get something like reinforcement learning. So, of course, many other uh, control uh, approaches. There's multi-agent control, distributed control, network control, cyber physical systems, uh, security, resilient cybersecurity, all of these kind of things. It's all very interesting. But uh, of course, if, if you're de dealing more with the uh, kind of in-depth things about control. All right. A bit more kind of um, strict example, so to speak, with some equations this time. Imagine you have two cars, one car following the other, uh, and uh, this kind of a system can be described by these equations up here, simple kinematics. Uh, assume that we can measure the distance between these two cars. So this distance essentially becomes our output. Uh, now, what we want to do in this case is, let's say we want this distance to be uh, some sort, some reference. Let's say we want to keep this distance constant. In reality, we might want it to vary with the speeds, but let's say we want to keep it constant. Okay, so what is our error in that case? Well, the difference between our reference and the measured speed, it's simply this desired distance minus this whole thing. So what we need to do, let's say we're controlling the follower vehicle, let's design the acceleration. I mean, that's basically the control input that we have. By the way, before I go into that, uh, what's the disturbance in this case? So this acceleration here, that essentially enters it as, a, as an external uh, command or as an external input. And then uh, uh, that's basically why we will have to control the, the, this car. Otherwise, just set the constant speed and it goes uh, without any issues. Right, so your first uh, attempt to designing the control might be, okay, let's just go with a very simple thing. Uh, let's just go, okay, the control is some sort of, a, you have the error, you multiply it by some constant, in this case, a negative constant because of how the system is posed. It should work, right? Well, it sort of works. Uh, what you get is you get an error that stays bounded, but uh, in this particular case, more or less because of the de delay of your action and the, the dynamics of the system, what you would actually get uh, is an oscillating error. So you have a car that will fall, uh, well, lag behind and catch up, will get way too close, lag behind and so on. And you see here, if you start at 10 meters uh, more than your uh, desired distance, you will be uh, 10 meters closer than your desired distance, which usually means a crash, right? 
So this does not really work. Uh, and yeah, by the way, I mentioned this is ju just known as a proportional controller. It's as simple as you can get more or less when, you when it comes to linear controllers. Next idea is, okay, let's maybe use the, the derivative of the error, or let's maybe measure the speed of the car in front of us, get the difference between that speed and our speed, and then plug that into the control. And then this definitely uh, helps the situation. So basically, if you're approaching your, uh, if you're uh, approaching the desired distance too quickly, then slow down. And what that does is it stabilizes the, the error. So the error goes to zero. It's all good. Uh, yeah, by the way, the first uh, notion is known as stability. The second notion would be asymptotic stability because you're asymptotically going to zero or exponential stability does not matter. Uh, but this is not good enough in some cases, especially if you have a, a situation of uh, vehicles, um, uh, ca cars following cars. Because look at what happens in, okay, in this case, you have one follower, Let's say the leader vehicle abruptly decreases its speed. What would happen is your error starts increasing quickly. Then you correct for it with your control and then bring it back to zero. And that's still fine. Let's say four meters was the desired distance. You're getting uncomfortably close, but you're not crashing. That's fine. Now, has the second follower react to what the this vehicle is doing? This is what it looks like. Still fine. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, uh oh, seventh one, or seventh one, I think, touches the car, eighth one already starts crashing. So there is this notion of string stability. So an even stronger kind of notion, which says that this error, in, in case you have this kind of a string of systems, this error needs to be either constant or either not increasing or going down. And by the way, if you look at all of these uh, uh, ACC, uh, fancy controls on the uh, uh, car, the modern cars, uh, do you think they're string stable? If you get a, a long string of uh, autonomous vehicles, of maybe not Teslas, but uh, some vehicles with adaptive cruise control, do you think they're string stable? No. <laughs> some of them are, but not all of them are. And you, you would think it, it's a kind of an important thing, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, things get even worse after some time. Now, the reason why this is important, uh, not only because of the, the kind of health of the traffic overall, health of, health of the traffic flow, uh, this becomes a, uh, particularly important if you start talking about platooning. Because with platooning, now, okay, what's a platoon? In this case, we're talking about a unit of electronically controlled vehicles that are driving together in sh with short headways. Uh, and uh, in this case, I'm particularly focusing on heavy duty vehicle uh, platooning, because uh, why that? Well, because for heavy duty vehicles, you get really nice reductions in air drag uh, as the distance between them decreases. And you can even get that in a personal car if you're behind the, a truck. So if you, the, if you get closer, you will see the, the fuel consumption go down. It's a bit too close for comfort, maybe on the highway. But uh, I mean, yeah, this, this is the thing that really happens. So there was a bunch of research happening on platooning, I don't know, 2000. 2010s, I would say. Uh, and yeah, of course, you can indeed uh, reduce the air drag. And as you're reducing the air drag, the resisted forces go down. Therefore, your fuel consumption will also go down off the, off the follower truck. Turns out even the leader truck might will get some uh, savings in air drag because what happens is you get a, a zone of low air pressure and then that zone hopefully combines with the zone of high air pressure in front of the follower. So you're getting uh, less air drag on your back in a sense. Now, this part, uh, uh, having trucks driving uh, uh, behind uh, each other, that part, I would say, from an academic standpoint, is largely solved. And there exist uh, technologies that are, uh, I think, being applied right now, or at least being ready to be applied. Uh, so that was a, a, a control challenge. But more or less, we are able to do that. Uh, it's transitioning into the industry. And you see a, a demonstration of Scania's trucks driving in a platoon. If I was playing this as a video, there would be a very hype music in the background, but I don't need to show every video. On the other side, uh, that's like control on a pretty low level. On the other side, there are many open questions when it comes to control on a higher level of uh, truck platooning. And there we can talk about uh, platoon maneuvers. Uh, here, what I mean is uh, catching up, uh, splitting, uh, mer merging, catching up and merging, splitting, reordering, overtaking, and so on. 
there's a lot of things to think about there. Uh, general coordination, as in how do we plan all of these maneuvers, basically, where do we split, where do we merge, all of that. Uh, and there are some, some questions that are, I would say still open. One is uh, how do these, how does platooning as, uh, uh, as a technology influence the traffic? And uh, there are some mixed, uh, there are some mixed um, opinions about this. So on one hand, you have trucks that are packed closer together, they're taking less space. On the other hand, for example, if they're blocking an off-ramp, that might not be good. Uh, but then also there's this question of how can we and can we at all exploit this for traffic control? And if I have time in the very end, I'll show you one example of uh, platoon uh, actuated control. But uh, a lot of the second part will also be uh, in this vein, at least. Uh, now, I talked about platoon formation. There has been some really interesting experiments. We had the trucks on real roads, and uh, you basically task the one that is further ahead, okay, go a bit slower, the one behind go a bit faster, and then catch up and merge. And uh, uh, this is, um, I mean, yeah, this has been done on, on real traffics. Uh, and if you think about um, why we need that, well, maybe you don't always need to pre-form platoons before departing. It would be great to have some, uh, if, some um, flexibility to see, okay, there's a truck in front of me, let's platoon. Right, so then you catch up, merge into a platoon, and continue until you split at some point. In low low density traffic, this is not that hard because you don't really have the traffic to kind of uh, bother you. Uh, however, if you have heavy traffic, as you can see here, by the way, this is a, a clip from one of the uh, platooning experiments. Uh, there, this is the camera view from one truck. I believe this truck here is the truck that. Ego truck was trying to merge with into a platoon, but you can see there's a car in, in, in the middle. So there are some complications with that. And you really want to quantify when exactly are you going to be able to merge because if not, you have a delay and then delays reduce the benefits of platooning because you'll be able to platoon for a shorter time. Uh, you also get uncertainty, which makes it much harder to plan how to do these platooning. And in general, this uh, this kind of a mutual influence between the heavy duty vehicles and the rest of the traffic is something that definitely should be better understood. Because this truck is going slower and trapping this vehicle, and then this vehicle is uh, pestering the ego vehicle. So yeah, it's it's a bit of a, a tricky thing. All right, enough about platooning. Let's get back into the traffic and the traffic control. Uh, this part will actually be a bit uh, short. So uh, while uh, yeah, while we still have the energy, let's talk a bit about uh, how do we model the, the traffic and then uh, about some uh, very, very classical traffic control methods. Right, so I believe you, well, okay. So let, let's start with the vehicle. We have the same uh, situation as we had in the car following uh, situation. In this case, yeah, your this acceleration of a car will depend on the, the gap between your, your vehicle and the vehicle in front of it, and as well as, broadly speaking, as well as the, the speed difference. You can say, you can uh, pose the equations like this and then have a thousand vehicles, and that does work, but that's a microscopic way of thinking about things, uh, which is very, very complicated, or complicated to simulate once you have a lot of vehicles. So instead, what we want to do is just say, okay, this speed will simply depend uh, on the traffic conditions. What you get when you do that is, of course, our well-known and uh, well-loved Lytle Whitham Richards model, of course. Uh, I believe you all have plenty of experience with this. Uh, what is this? It's simply a conservation law. Traffic uh, flow defined as a function of traffic density, and the traffic density is simply evolving uh, according to this traffic flow. Now, it's a fair, pretty simple uh, model. And yeah, of course, the traffic uh, flow depends uh, as some sort of a flux function or a fundamental diagram, uh, according to the, uh, well, depends on the traffic density, according to this. And then, of course, you have the, the speed that depends uh, in a similar way, because flow is simply speed times density. Uh, fairly simple model, but uh, you, uh, I mean, how comfortable are you with the dealing with PDs? So they can be a bit tricky. They're uh, they're really nice when you get to know them, but they can be a bit tricky to deal with uh, otherwise. So what we do otherwise, what we do because we don't want to deal with PDs, of course, is we discretize the road, split the road into cells, and then get a cell transmission model. So you have the, the you basically track what happens with the traffic density in each cell, uh, and the traffic density in each cell will depend on the traffic the inflow uh, minus the outflow from the cell. 
uh, and these flows will be a minimum between the demand and the demand of the current cell and the supply of the cell downstream. Demand, you can say it looks something like this, and then supply something like this as a function of that. Of, of that. Nothing too uh, crazy here. Uh, one extra thing that we need in this case is, uh, of course, we need to add the on and off ramps. And in this case, thinking ahead to ramp metering, uh, this on-ramp flow, I'm uh, coloring it blue because we will be using that as our control input, essentially, because we will be controlling the inflow to the road in order to achieve some uh, some goals. All right, nothing too crazy. Now, I talked about capacity drop, and if you look at this model, well, I mean, you have congestion, but the outflow is still the capacity. So where's capacity drop? Well, you have to introduce it kind of externally. One way you can do that is you say, okay, the demand function now actually decreases as the density increases. So you can think about if you have a slight congestion, the vehicles are not moving all that slow, so they will accelerate faster. Whereas if they are at a standstill, they will take longer time to accelerate. So the outflow from this congestion will be lower. This is just one way of, of modeling that. Okay, so we change the demand function. And then finally, what we can add, now this is a bit more tricky when it comes to modeling. Uh, we will also be talking about variable speed limits. So how do variable speed limits come into play here? Simplest way probably uh, to do that is to say, okay, now what we actually can do is control the free flow speed. And that will enter the demand like this. So as you reduce the free flow speed, this function will get kind of lower and lower, essentially. Very, very simple. The simplest way of, of modeling uh, speed. Is it correct? Probably not, but it's very simple. And I think it's good enough for some sort of uh, intuitive understanding of what's going on. All right. That's more or less all we need for, for the model. Now, what is ramp metering? So I mentioned the, uh, the idea of ramp metering is you have some sort of an on-ramp. And usually that on-ramp is either upstream of the bottleneck or it is the bottleneck itself. So essentially what you would have is you have this one lane that is merging quickly into the, the mainstream. So you had three lanes. For a short time, there was also this merging lane. And then you go back to, to three lanes in this case. So while the, uh, the total flow of these on-ramp vehicles and the mainstream is low enough, this is fine. The vehicles will be able to merge. It's not a problem. However, if you think about this here part, as a, a separate part of the road, which a, a bit higher capacity because there's an extra lane. Now it's not uh, proportionate necessarily, but essentially it would look something like this, that, that the dotted line would hold in this here area. Now what you might get is that the added flow from this, so this, this dashed line represents how much flow is added from the on-ramp. Now, if this added flow is over the capacity of this part of the road, then these vehicles all arrive here, there's a traffic breakdown and congestion starts building. So after some time, one thing stabilize, uh, again, uh, if you plug in the equations of the, the capacity drop that I talked about before, you will get a situation that looks something like this. So we would get, uh, uh, yeah, so the, this is the, the traffic density that forms here. You get tra um, you get the capacity drop and you get the outflow that is lower than the capacity of this part of the road. So that's not something that we want. Obviously we want to recover capacity. The way we can do that is of course we close down the on-ramp and essentially try to shift the queuing from the road itself to this on-ramp. On By doing that, the uh, flow that is arriving at this, in this to this point, uh, is actually going to be lower than the flow leaving this area. And because of that, over time, this congestion will dissipate and we will recover uh, free flow. All right. After that, uh, what we have is, okay, we have still, we have still a closed on ramp, but now that's restricting traffic too much. So instead we will try to uh, let vehicles enter, but just enough in a sense that uh, you, you only let as many vehicles enter as the road can handle, essentially, or as the bottom can handle. Uh, and uh, there are actually some, um, quite a bit of uh, ramp metering, uh, well, 
probably the most present traffic control measure, if you don't count the uh, traffic lights, of course. Well, I mean, this is a traffic light, but specific type of a traffic light. Uh, and yeah, it works. It's a very old uh, kind of uh, methodology. It comes from before 90s, because uh, uh, definitely much before 90s, but that's where it kind of uh, got the, really got going, uh, among other things. Uh, okay. Ramp metering, it works. Uh, and the, the idea here basically was, okay, let's shift the congestion from the road to some off-ramp. Now, when you start thinking about, and yeah, of course, if you think about uh, ramp metering uh, as a control system, you will have a situation like this. So you have traffic conditions, in this case, specifically in this zone. Uh, you have a traffic light uh, at the on-ramp as the actuator. Uh, the ramp metering logic is your co uh, controller. That's one the one that we already talked about. And then you have the traffic flow sensor, which you can place at a different, yeah, th there are different options. You can place it here, you can place it here, you can place it here. You measure some sort of a, yeah. As long as you get some notion of how, how fluid the traffic is, you can get around uh, and uh, do, you do your feedback control. All right. So that was basically taking congestion off the road. Now, if you don't have a, uh, if you don't have traffic, uh, if you don't have an on ramp to kind of cut the inflow, what can you do then? Well, one way to do one way to control mainstream traffic is to use variable speed limits control, uh, and I set that up a bit by talking about uh, how differ different uh, speed limits might affect your your uh, uh, flux function. So uh, this kind of control is usually not uh, really applied for uh, traffic control practices in the sense of reducing congestion, I would say most often it is actually applied for uh, for safety. And the idea is if you uh, if you have a congestion downstream, maybe it's not a good idea to have vehicles moving at full speed when they enter this congestion because there might be quite some crashes at the, at the highway. So if you detect some congestion downstream, then you might act proactively and lower the speed upstream of this congestion in order to kind of harmonize the speed and make this uh, this whole flow uh, more uh, fluid. Well, not more fluid, but more uh, homogeneous and safer. And as a result, safer. Uh, however, I uh, there are some works, at least, uh, that uh, talk about uh, using the, these variable speed limits uh, for mainstream control. So it's controlling basically the the traffic flow on the road itself, uh, and uh, one. One situation where that might be uh, needed or where you might want to do that is when you have a phantom jam that is happening on the road and persisting. So basically, you have your congestion. Now, there is some... So I'll get to the, the modeling part of why, why I'm modeling it like this. Basically, because of some sort of capacity drop, you do not discharge from this congestion at capacity. Instead, you discharge at the lower uh, density, at the lower traffic flow. Because of that, what you have, uh, let's say this is the level of inflow. This is the level of outflow. Of course, you get uh, that the congestion will increase because the inflow is higher than the outflow. So what you can try doing in this case uh, is you have, you look at the, uh, you look at the, some zone upstream of this congestion, and you might want to reduce the traffic speed in the zone that is approaching this phantom traffic jam. Now, by doing that, you're not necessarily changing things um, in stationary state. It's a bit complicated to, to explain the reasoning, maybe, but because basically, okay, you lower the speed, vehicles just pack tighter together, and then they come to a, a zone where the speed is higher, and yeah, it's not necessarily going to be all that good. And also you are creating some congestion. So basically at this point where you go, when you lower the traffic speed, there will be some congestion forming here. But the idea here is that by, by doing that, we can uh, perturb the traffic in a less severe way. So basically you try to move some congestion from this phantom jam upstream to the point where you're actually doing control. And by doing that, you're hoping that the congestion here is less severe than the congestion here. And the effect will be that, uh, for one, uh, you cut the inflow to this congestion, and uh, let's say the congestion gets uh, the inflow gets cut to this level, so it is now lower than the outflow, and the congestion will dissipate. But another thing is that the congestion that you create here 
is actually a less dense than congestion. So the, the density here is higher than the density here. And then once, once you're done controlling, there will be a, a phantom jam propagating from that point, but hopefully it is less severe, and then you are able to recover free flow after some time. Uh, no equations here because it gets a bit more complicated, but uh, that is broadly the idea uh, that, that, that we want to do. So you, what you want to do is uh, you control the speed limits so that this kind of transient, con uh, transient congestion uh, that is uh, a result of a phantom jam is dissipated. And then you basically let the congestion that you've just created this. So I will not talk more about uh, variable speed limits, but this kind of an idea of controlling the vehicle or controlling the traffic flow on the mainstream, that will become definitely uh, important for the second part, uh, which I believe we are there. Yeah, so there, there are many works on, on uh, variable speed limits as well. I can point you to some if you're interested. I believe this one, uh, this one specifically looks at the dissipating phantom jams by using this kind of a, a control logic. And that uh, brings us more or less to the end of the, the classical traffic control. I'll do one slide more, and then we do a break. Uh, and the slide is more, more or less talking about, yeah, so what will I be talking about? I'll come back to that after the break, but this is just kind of like a spoiler, right? So what can these uh, clients autonomous vehicles really give us, if you think about that? So uh, you really have, I mean, connected and autonomous, obviously comes from two parts, connected, and autonomous. For autonomy, you do need the connected part most of the time, or probably, but it is really the two sets of benefits that they confer to us. So first, from the connected side, one thing that the connected vehicles provide us is uh, pretty highly uh, detailed uh, traffic data, because if they are communicating their own movements and their trajectories, then that is, I mean, that is a lot of the data. That is more, uh, that is much more data than what you would get from a uh, um, a, in an induction loop. An induction loop only gives you, okay, there's a car moving at this speed, broadly speaking, and so on. If you have the full trajectory, you have much more information with exactly what's happening in the traffic. I'll talk a bit more about how exactly you can utilize this kind of information. Uh, next part. Uh, but also, uh, yeah, so the other part of that is uh, the, the kind of, so this is vehicles sending information, but vehicles receive information now this is something that enables uh, cooperative control schemes so if the, you receive an information uh, that the vehicle in front of you is braking then you might act on that or an automated system might act on that before you actually uh, notice the, the distance uh, going down and there are actually many uh, there's a lot of work on uh, these uh, protocols of uh, vehicle to vehicle communication vehicle to infrastructure communication there's a lot of work to that, but uh, what do you think right now, today, what portion of vehicles have some sort of a communication device inside of them that is communicating with the outside world? This is a trick question. So my, my professor used to tell me that uh, when you're asked about the number, the answer is either zero or one. That's like most often it's zero or one. It's close to 100% because drivers have phones. And... Uh, a lot of times it is enough, or it is plenty actually, to have uh, the, the cell phones from the cars. And there are some really nice works uh, on um, uh, kind of trying to reconstruct the information about the traffic by, by just using the cell phone data. Uh, I am, of course, cheating. A lot of times it is not, a, uh, it is not enough. Uh, and this will definitely not enable uh, cooperative control schemes. Uh, but you still can get some information from the, the vehicles, even just by using phones. And uh, I mean, how do you think Google does their traffic uh, traffic con condition estimation, right? What that might bring you to is actually something that is a bit uh, potentially tricky, where you can get uh, uh, you get a bunch of phones, you put it in a kind of pull cart, and you just walk along the road. What happens is Google and of course, you set the, the, uh, the phones to be in navigation mode, so as if you were driving. What Google sees is there's a lot of very, very, very slow cars on this road. And uh, 
you can affect what well at least back at that time you could affect what the, the google maps at least think the traffic situation is so of course these kind of uh, things they, they have uh, a limit uh, also there were some interesting uh, uh, you know ways the app uh ways is even better when it comes to to these things because you can actually give uh, so you're not only kind of providing your own uh, uh your own uh, trajectory but you can also tell the well, tell google basically what's going on on the road so what you had i'm not sure if it was ways or google maps but uh i think there was this case where some neighborhood in california was basically reporting crashes on their roads so that ways would send vehicles other way so I mean, you can you can play play this game in in many ways. It is, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's some interesting uh, some interesting things. But basically, if you can get the trajectories, you're doing fine. Uh, on the other side, uh, what does autonomy give us? Well, the probably the main uh, well, okay. Apart from not having to think about driving, uh, when it comes to the traffic, uh, there is this promise that. Uh, Autonomous vehicles will be safer and uh, well more efficient for the traffic flow than human drivers. Uh, the second part that it can provide us is there is this potential for using the autonomous vehicles for Lagrangian control, which is what the second part uh, will be about. Uh, now, depending on how cynical you are about this statement that autonomous vehicles uh, will make the traffic safer, you, you can either Google uh, autopilot predicts crash or autopilot fail. Uh, there's plenty of videos on both uh, topics. It's, some of them are really interesting. I mean, these things are working to a degree, but at least it's interesting to see that there's uh, stuff going on. Now, when it comes to the control, the in explicit control, uh, a lot of work has gone into uh, using these uh, autonomous vehicles for smoothing the traffic flow. Uh, and that is basically thinking, okay, how can I drive... Uh, really well, like how can I be a good driver that helps the traffic flow kind of stabilize and absorb all of these kind of uh, uh, disturbances. And you have some experience, uh, some experiments on that, that show some quite nice results. So here, they, what they did was they had a bunch of cars driving in circles. I know, very exciting, right? They had one car and they, as you can see, after some time, the speed starts oscillating because, because of these kind of phantom jams creating inside of this circle. Now, they had one vehicle, which was uh, human-driven while these uh, in these zones. And then it, when the trajectory is red, then it is automatically driven. And you can see that the this vehicle going slower than a human driver would drive it basically stabilizes this traffic flow. So you end up with a higher speed and without, without a lot of these oscillations. And then I believe at some point they turn off the, the autonomous driving or then the traffic goes back to its normally oscillating state. And this was done with a very, very simple controller. I think it was just a PI controller or something like that. So the, these kind of things, uh, they've been shown to work. Uh, the caveat is, of course, yeah, you need to know what you're doing. Otherwise, you can do, you can destabilize the the traffic. There is another layer to this, I would say, and that is that you could actually control these vehicles to think of a more global effect on the traffic. So you you are dealing with uh, if you're dealing with smoothing the traffic flow, you're acting very locally or thinking very locally. There is a way that I will talk about to actually move these vehicles and control these vehicles in a way that the traffic state elsewhere is is improved and that's what we're will pick up with <laughs>